Welcome back. Now that we have a good understanding of how messages are transmitted through a nervous system, now we're ready to start to understand the mechanisms by which information from the interior and exterior environment is converted into these electrochemical signals that can be transmitted through the nervous system. Animals have senses of all kinds. So for example, many moths are active at night when it's difficult to see. So many of them release chemical attractants to find mates. So they send out these chemical signals just into the air to see what other moths are around. Male moths can detect even a single molecule of the, these pheromones, these chemical signals in the air using millions and millions of receptors in these feathery antennae that are highly specific to the particular chemicals that are being received and incredibly sensitive. This is the way moths find each other in the dark, um, but moths also are vulnerable to other creatures that are out hunting in the dark. So bats hunt these moths using sonar to detect the moths and fly toward them. So they use echolocation, they emit a sound that bounces off any objects in the environment, including moths, when they receive a signal back off an object they'll be able to detect and create a reconstruction of that object to be able to pursue, for example, this moth. So this is using their own vocalizations. Some moths can hear that sound that is produced by bats and detect the sound and when they do sort of tumble out of the air, have different evasive maneuvers to try to avoid that bat. And in fact, some moths have even evolved the ability to produce sounds themselves that are going to interfere and sort of jam that sonar signal from the bat to confuse them. All of these signals, these chemical signals and these very, very high-pitched echolocation sounds coming from the bats are completely undetectable by humans. We're not even aware of any of these signals. So how is it that animals can sense the world around them in different ways? How do we get these different ranges of sensitivity in different organisms? So let's first look at the, the stimuli. So all stimuli, any kind of signal coming from either the internal or external environment, represent some form of energy. And a sensory receptor is going to convert that stimulus energy into a change in membrane potential. This is a language that's understood by the nervous system. When a stimulus is received and processed by the nervous system, a motor response may be generated to in some way deal with that stimulus. And each type of sensory information is detected by a sensory neuron or by a specialized receptor cell that makes a synapse with a sensor neuron. So in either case, we're going to eventually end up in the sensory portion of the peripheral nervous system, taking that message inward toward the central nervous system. The ability to sense a change in the environment depends on two processes. Transduction is the conversion of an external stimulus to an internal signal in the form of action potential. So if you will, translating some kind of signal in the environment, either internal or external, into these electrochemical signals that the nervous system is able to understand. And then transmission of that signal to the central nervous system where it's going to be integrated and processed to determine what, if any, kind of response is necessary. A sensory pathway begins with sensory reception, detection of that stimulus by sensory receptors. So sensory receptors are sensory cells or organs and they interact with stimuli both inside and outside the body. So we need to monitor internal conditions as well as what's going on outside the body. And sensory receptors may be neurons themselves, so usually the dendrites of neurons, so some kind of stimulus is going to affect this neuronal receptor which is going to send that signal directly to the central nervous system for processing. Or the actual sensor might be a non-neuronal receptor, which is going to respond to that stimulus by releasing neurotransmitters that are going to be received by the sensory or afferent neuron. During the resting state in most sensory cells, either neuronal or non-neuronal, the inside of the plasma membrane is negative relative to the outside, just the same as what we saw in neural transmission. If ion flows cause the inside to become less negative than the resting potential, then the membrane is depolarized. Same thing that we've been seeing. 
If ion flows cause the inside to become more negative than the resting potential, then that membrane is hyperpolarized. And the change in membrane potential allows different types of stimuli to be transduced to a common type of signal, one that can be interpreted by the brain, these electrochemical signals. If a sensory stimulus induces a large change in a sensory receptor's membrane potential, there's a change in the firing rate of action potential sent to the brain. So remember that the strength of the stimulus is going to be coded by the frequency of action potentials, the firing rate of action potentials, and that's going to be changed in some way in response to the sensory stimulus. So for example, if we look at the sensory receptor, if we apply a gentle pressure to it, it's going to have a relatively low frequency of action potentials per receptor. If you push on a little bit harder, you're going to have a very high rate of action potentials per receptor. The amount of depolarization or hyperpolarization of the sensory receptor is going to be proportional to the intensity of the stimulus. So this is a graded potential, just like the one that we saw in neurons. And for example, the amount of depolarization that occurs in a sound receptor cell is going to be proportional to the loudness of the sound. So this change in membrane potential, there's a sound stimulus, this will be much higher much more likely to trigger an action potential for a loud sound, lower, less likely to trigger an action potential for a softer sound. And just as we said before, also the rate of firing of action potentials is going to differ for louder sounds as compared to softer sounds with a much larger number of action potentials per second for a louder sound, lower number of action potentials per second for a softer sound. So if the depolarization passes threshold, enough voltage-gated sodium channels open to trigger action potentials that are relayed to the brain. Receptor cells tend to be highly specific. So for example, each receptor in a human ear responds best to only certain frequencies or pitches of sound, so higher pitched sounds or lower pitched sounds. And each type of sensory neuron sends its signal to a specific portion of the brain. So different regions are specialized for interpreting different types of stimuli. For example, sound is interpreted in the temporal lobes along the two sides of the brain, while sight is interpreted generally by the occipital lobes toward the back of the brain. Processing of sensory information can occur before, during, and after transmission of action potentials to the central nervous system. So integration often begins as soon as the information is received. We'll see how this works in the next web lecture when we think about vision. So let's think about what perception is. So perceptions are the brain's construction of stimuli. So when the brain takes all of these action potentials and all of these pathways of action potentials and puts them together, it's going to reconstruct something about the external world. So stimuli from different sensory receptors travel as action potentials along dedicated neural pathways. And the brain distinguishes stimuli from different receptors based on the path by which that action potential arrived in the brain. These signals can be altered at various points uh, along these pathways. So amplification is the strengthening of a sensory signal during transduction. This can happen either when your brain chooses to pay specific attention to a particular stimulus, that stimulus can be amplified, the signal can be amplified. And conversely, sensory adaptation Please don't confuse this with evolutionary adaptation. Sensory adaptation is a decrease in responsiveness, usually to continued uh, stimulation. So this is that phenomenon of, for example, nose blindness. If you're exposed to a certain smell for long enough, you will stop detecting it. Many types of sensory receptors convey the change in environment into electrical signals. So there are different types, categories of sensory receptors. In my list, I'm going to break these down a little bit more finely than your book does. So mechanoreceptors is one general category of sensory receptors that all use the same mechanisms for signal transduction. So mechanoreceptors respond to distortion caused by some kind of pressure. Photoreceptors are one category of what your book is calling electromagnetic receptors, um, I've split this out into several categories because the different categories of these electromagnetic receptors really use different mechanisms. 
to transduce that signal. Photoreceptors are the one that we're going to talk about in detail in the next web lecture, and these are going to respond to particular wavelengths of light. But you should also know about the other kinds of electromagnetic receptors, electroreceptors that detect electrical fields, and magnetoreceptors that detect magnetic fields. Generally, we know about these because of the way animals use them to detect the Earth's magnetic fields for the purpose of migration. Chemoreceptors detect specific molecules, uh, specific chemical molecules in the environment. And then thermoreceptors detect changes in temperature. And nociceptors, also known as pain receptors, sense harmful stimuli such as tissue injury. So let's take a closer look at some of these. So as we said, mechanoreceptors sense physical deformation in these receptor cells, so a pushing in some way on these receptor cells. And these are going to be caused by forms of mechanical energy, an actual force applied to these cells. And they typically consist of ion channels linked to structures that end outside the cell, such as we call these hair cells, so little cilia that project off of the cell. So the pushing in one direction or the other on these hair cells is going to cause ion channels to open or close and send that, that signal. So for example, the mammalian sense of touch relies on mechanoreceptors that are actually the dendrites of the sensory neurons. So these are going to send that signal directly. So we see a couple of examples here. Uh, close to the surface, we're going to have sensory cells that are gonna to respond to very gentle pressures, uh, gentle deformations, Deeper down in the tissue, we've got sensors that are going to detect stronger pressure. There are sensors around the hairs that are going to detect hair movement, so this is why you can feel it when someone touches your hair, even though your hairs are non-living. Stretching these receptors attached to the hair follicle is going to cause that signal to be transmitted. There are a variety of mechanisms for mechanoreception, but they do all share the similar features of being sensitive to deformations of the cell. So, Crabs have a fluid-filled organ that helps them sense the pressure created by gravity. So these are going to be detecting the direction of gravity. In other words, the animal's orientation with respect to, to gravity. And they are going to have an organ called a statocyst. The statocyst contains a calcium-rich substance that rests on the bottom. So it's going to have a higher density than the rest of the fluid in that chamber. When flipped over, the calcium substance presses against receptors. Again, it's going to deform them in some way by pushing on them that are not on the bottom of the organ that's gonna send an action potential to the brain. So hopefully this is sounding very familiar to you. This is almost exactly the same as the way plants detect gravity and this gravitropic response. They're going to sense the pressure of a statolith against sensory cells, and if they're not pushing on the right place, there's gonna be a response. So the crab is gonna respond by activating muscles that restore the animal to the normal position with respect to gravity. Pressure sensing systems are used for a variety of changes in the environment, such as direct physical pressure on the skin, so this is our sense of touch, hearing by detecting pressure changes in the air, the stretching of muscles and blood vessels, so when the dendrites of the neurons surrounding these muscle cells or blood vessels are stretched or deformed, it's going to send a signal back to the brain that there's some internal change going on. And aquatic animals detect pressure waves via um, something called a lateral line system, which we'll learn more about later on in this web lecture. Chemoreceptors primarily consist of the sense of taste and the sense of smell, and they originate in chemoreceptors, so receptors that are sensitive to the binding of particular molecules. Some chemoreceptors transmit information about the total solute concentration of a solution. So if you think back to when we were talking about homeostasis and water balance, we said that the uh, osmolarity of the blood was detected um, in various points in the circulatory system, and it's these chemoreceptors that detect the total osmolarity, the total solute concentration, and allow that signal to be sent to the brain if the blood becomes too concentrated to go get a drink of water. Other chemoreceptors respond to individual kinds of molecules. So this has to do with our sense of taste or gustation or the sense of smell, olfaction. Particular 
receptors are going to respond to particular molecules that are going to give us the different various kinds of tastes and smells that we can detect. So when a stimulus molecule binds to a chemoreceptor, the chemoreceptor becomes more or less permeable to ions, and this is going to be by way of ligand-gated channels. So for example, the antennae of the male silkworm moth have very sensitive and very specific chemoreceptors that allow it to detect, remember, even just one molecule from a female silkworm moth in the air and allow it to go and find that female. Electromagnetic receptors detect electromagnetic energy such as light, electricity, and magnetism. For example, the platypus has electroreceptors on its bill, sort of lining the outside edge of its bill, that allow it to detect the electric field generated by muscle contractions in its prey items, such as small crustaceans and fish that it digs around in the mud at the bottom of ponds to find, and it can sense the presence using the electroreceptors on its bill. Magnetoreception, or sensing magnetic fields, has been described in many groups of organisms, including bacteria, fungi, invertebrates, and vertebrates. And while the mechanisms are still unclear, a lot of research has been done, particularly on orientation during migration in birds. It's known that terrestrial animals sense the magnetic field directly. So one hypothesis is that deposits of iron that are present in receptors in the beak of these migrating birds play a role in responding to these magnetic fields, allowing them to figure out where they are with respect to the magnetic fields on Earth. Thermoreceptors detect heat and cold, obviously. Uh, animals thermoregulate to maintain their body temperature within an acceptable range. To be able to do that, they need to be able to sense when they're too hot or too cold. Thermoreceptors are found in the skin and outer surfaces of animals. This is the most important part of sensing the environmental temperature and determining what kinds of responses are needed to maintain that steady body temperature. Some depolarize in response to cooling, so they're going to be sensitive to cold. Others do so in response to heating, so we're going to have separate receptors, separate sensors that are going to be responsible for cold detection and heat detection. Extreme temperatures are going to be sensed by a nociceptor or pain receptor, which also perceives other pain sensations. So if the temperature is so extreme that it's going to cause tissue damage, we're going to perceive that um, temperature as pain. So for example, um, pit vipers, certain snakes have little thermal sensing pit organs that are located just in front and below the eyes that allow it to detect heat that's being generated by its prey item to be able to detect that prey even if it can't visually see it. It can sense its heat. Another example, uh, jalapeno and cayenne peppers contain a substance called capsaicin. And receptors that respond to capsaicin, this, this spicy molecule that causes that burning sensation, also respond to high temperatures by opening a calcium channel. So it's the exact same receptors that respond to the chemical signal and also respond to temperature signals. So literally when you eat spicy food, you are sensing heat using the same receptors. In humans as well as other animals, pain receptors or nociceptors detect stimuli that reflect harmful conditions that are going to result in tissue damage to allow the animal to respond in an appropriate way to minimize that tissue damage. So they respond to excess heat, pressure, or chemicals uh, released from the damaged or inflamed tissues. So these chemicals produced in an animal's body sometimes enhance the perception of pain. So we've got sight of an injury that's going to trigger a pathway that's going to cause the release of prostaglandins. And prostaglandins are going to actually intensify that sensation of pain to make sure that the painful uh, tissue damage is, is dealt with appropriately. So now we're going to shift our focus to just mechanoreception and hearing and balance, the perception of body equilibrium, your position in space, movement of the body through space. Um, these two mechanoreceptive senses are very closely related in most animals. For both of these senses, settling particles or moving fluid is detected by mechanoreceptors, receptors that are going to detect some kind of deformation in the cell.
direct physical pressure on the plasma membrane or distortion of membrane structures by bending changes the conformation of ion channels. This is going to cause the channels to open or close depending on the direction of bending. The consequent change in ion flow leads to either depolarization or hyperpolarization and this is going to change the frequency of action potentials in a sensory neuron. So there's going to be sort of a steady rate of firing of action potentials usually in these systems and then any kind of change in the ion flow, any kind of change in the membrane potential of these sensors is going to affect the rate of firing of action potentials. First let's take a look at sensing gravity and vertebrates. We've already talked a little bit about this uh, when we gave that example for mechanoreceptors. So most invertebrates maintain equilibrium using mechanoreceptors located in these organs called statocysts. So here's an example of this little fluid-filled organ surrounded by receptor cells. Statocysts contain mechanoreceptors that are going to detect the movements of these high-density objects in here called statoliths. So the statolith will settle wherever, whatever direction is down relative to gravity. So this is going to allow the animal to detect the orientation of, of its body with respect to gravity. So statoliths provide information about the body position with respect to gravity. If it's upside down, these are going to settle here on the top. The animal is going to say that's all wrong and respond by flipping itself over. In invertebrates, um, sound is detected differently than we see in vertebrates. So many insects have body hairs that vibrate in response to sound waves. So this is detecting those pressure waves, those vibrations in the air directly, and it'll be transduced into a change in the firing of action potentials in response to those sound waves. Many also detect sound with localized organs consisting of a tympanic membrane, so a little film of tissue that's stretched over some kind of an internal air chamber. So as that membrane vibrates in response to vibrations in the air, it's going to cause movement of the air inside that air chamber, which is going to distort some kind of sensory cells inside the air chamber. So for example, a cricket has a tympanic membrane like this located on its legs, so it basically hears through its legs, and this is going to cover one of those air-filled chambers that's going to receive these sound vibrations. The moths that we talked about at the very beginning of this web lecture are able to detect the sounds of bats using a similar structure located just under the wing. It's going to be a little tympanic membrane that vibrates. You can see it in a microscope image here, this little tympanic membrane that's going to allow the moth to hear that approaching bat. So for our example of the mammalian ear, we're going to think about the human ear. Other vertebrate ears work in a similar way, um, some of them a lot less complicated. So the ear transduces sound waves, so pressure waves in the air, into action potentials that carry information to the brain. The human ear has three sections. The outer ear consists of the pinna, which is the external ear flap that we see in many but not all mammals, and also the auditory canal, everything leading up to the tympanic membrane, which is the border between the outer ear and the middle ear. The middle ear consists of a chain of very small bones called the auditory ossicles, and then this ends at the oval window, which is the connection between the middle ear and the inner ear, which is where the sound is actually transduced. The outer ear, which projects from the head, collects these pressure waves in the air and funnels them into the ear canal, where these waves are going to strike the tympanic membrane and cause it to vibrate. The tympanic membrane vibrates with the same frequency as the sound waves and passes those vibrations to these three tiny bones, the auditory ossicles, that are also going to vibrate against one another in response to this vibration. So it's got direct contact with the tympanic membrane, so we're seeing kind of a blow up of this region here. The tympanic membrane vibrates. It's going to vibrate the malleus, which is going to in turn cause the incus to vibrate, which is going to cause the stapes to vibrate. The stapes is in direct contact with the oval window, so it's going to communicate that vibration into the inner ear. So in response, the oval window is going to oscillate and generate waves in the fluid inside a chamber called the cochlea.
So this is a part of the cochlea. You can see the cochlea right here. We're seeing just a little bit of it in this blow up. And this is where the actual sound transduction is going to happen in the inner ear. So the hair cells within the cochlea are what's going to actually sense these pressure waves. The pressure waves are going to cause them to deflect and deform, sending that signal. The middle ear is specialized for amplifying sounds so that mammals can detect very, very quiet sounds that other animals are not able to detect. So first of all, the difference in size between these membranes. The tympanic membrane is about 15 times larger than the oval window. So the amount of vibration induced by sound waves is going to be increased by a factor of 15 when it reaches the oval window just as a result of this difference in size. Also, the three little bones in the middle ear are going to act as physical levers that are going to amplify the sound. So with every transition from one bone to the next, the vibrations are going to be increased a little bit so that the overall effect of both the difference in size between the membranes and the amplification from these middle ear bones is to amplify the sound by a factor of about 22. So that means that soft sounds are amplified enough to stimulate the hair cells of the cochlea. Mammals have incredibly sensitive hearing. So what is the cochlea? Let's take a look at this main sound transducer in the middle ear. So this is the cochlea here. It looks kind of like a snail shell. It's a coiled tube. This is all made of bone. And it's got a set of internal membranes that divide it into three chambers. So if we look at a cross section through one part of this coiled tube, we see these two membranes that divide it into these different fluid-filled chambers. So hair cells form rows in the middle chamber, and they're kind of sandwiched in between the these two membranes that separate the chamber. So if we look at a close-up view of this little area here from this middle chamber, we can see that these cells are embedded in a layer of tissue. So you can see all these cells surrounding them and holding them in place that sits atop a membrane called the basilar membrane. So that's this bottom membrane that's separating these two bottom chambers. And so the hair cells are sticking up out of this tissue sitting on top of the basilar membrane, and they're projecting up into another membrane called the tectorial membrane. So this is coming in direct contact with these little hair cells. So when sound waves, these vibrations, come through these fluid-filled chambers, they're going to cause the basilar membrane to vibrate. So these hair cells are going to move. The tectorial membrane stays in place which is what's going to cause the deflection, the deformation of these little hair cells as the basilar membrane vibrates. The basilar membrane also varies in stiffness as you go along through this cochlea. So what we're looking at here is if we could imagine just uncoiling the snail shell and pulling it mostly straight. If we look at different points at varying distance from the oval window, we're going to see that there's different degrees of stiffness at different points. So it's going to be stiffer and more resistant to vibrating near the oval window, and it's going to have less resistance. It's going to be more flexible and vibrate more readily as we get to the other end. So this means that sounds of different frequencies cause the membrane to vibrate maximally in specific locations along its length. So if we look at point A, here in the basilar membrane, it's going to be most sensitive to sounds around 6,000 hertz, so high frequency sounds. It's going to take a high frequency vibration to move this relatively stiff portion of the basilar membrane. Intermediate frequency sounds are going to be detected here at point B in the middle, and then very low frequency sounds are going to be detected further on. This is going to vibrate a lot more readily because it's more flexible at that point. The hair cells in that location were bent one way and then the other by the tectorial membrane as the basilar membrane vibrates. The tectorial membrane is kind of holding the tops in place causing this bending of the hair cells. So each region of the basilar membrane is tuned to a particular vibration frequency. So this cochlea can detect both volume in terms of the amplitude of the vibrations, how strong the vibrations are, and it also detects the frequency of the vibration by having different sensitivities at different locations. So it can detect volume and pitch.
The bending of hair cells depolarizes the membrane of mechanoreceptors and sends action potentials to the brain by way of the auditory nerve. So here is an example of a hair cell that is not being bent. It's sending action potentials at a particular rate. It's got some amount of neurotransmitter that's being released by this receptor cell to the sensory neuron. If this hair cell is bent in one direction, it's going to increase the rate of action potentials by releasing more neurotransmitter to this sensory cell. That's going to increase the rate of action potentials. If this hair cell is bent in the other direction. You see these little hairs bending the other way. This is going to hyperpolarize this membrane, as you see here. Less neurotransmitter is going to be released, and that's going to result in a much lower rate of firing of action potentials. Different species of mammals have different sensitivities uh, to sound. Um, compared with the hearing of many mammals, human hearing is not particularly acute. We, as primates, really specialize uh, in visual perception. So humans can hear sounds between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Elephants use infrasonic vocalizations. So this is sound with frequencies that are too low for human ear to hear to communicate. So their sensitivity range is down toward the lower end of frequencies. We can record these sounds and change their frequency so that we can hear them. But when the elephants actually make these sounds to each other, we can't hear them at all. Infrasounds have the advantage that they can travel exceptionally long distances and this will potentially allow wild elephants to communicate with each other even when they're miles apart. So these very low frequency sounds not only travel long distances, but they're also very good at sort of moving around objects to enable very, very long distance communication. Bats have hearing sensitivity at the other range for very, very high frequency sounds. Again, we can detect these sounds using equipment. We can change their frequencies to bring them into the range that we can hear, but just normally with our own ears, we can't hear these sounds at all. So bats use ultrasonic sounds. They use ultrasound for echolocation. So here's a bat sending out one of these echolocation signals, basically just vocalizing. When an object is, is in the path of these sound waves, sound waves are going to bounce off of the object and come back to the bats who are going to hear them and form incredibly detailed uh, representations in their brain of the nature of that object it's hit. So bats can detect something as small as a mosquito using echolocation. So bats again, generate these high frequency sounds with their larynx. These waves bounce off of surfaces so they can both avoid obstacles, avoid running into things in the dark, and also find prey items. And they're gonna bounce off the surfaces and produce echoes that the bat can detect. And a huge area of the bat's inner ear is specialized for sensing the high frequency sounds of the returning echoes. So we can actually tell by the size of the cochlea whether this bat uses echolocation or not. This is very useful when analyzing fossil bats, uh, reconstructing the evolutionary history of bats. We can actually see in the fossil record the size of that cochlea and determine whether that was an echolocating bat or not. The part of the brain used to process sound is also unusually large in bats, as you would expect. They're basically forming some sort of image or representation in their brain of their environment based on these sounds. Now let's think about our sense of equilibrium or balance. So there are several organs in the inner ear that detect body movement, position, and balance. These are located in the inner ear. So first we have the utricle and saccule. These are two fluid-filled chambers that contain hair cells projecting into sort of a gelatinous material. And this gelatinous material is contained in these structures called a cupula. So they're going to surround kind of a cluster of these little hair cells. And as fluid flows across this cupula, it's going to push on it, cause the whole thing to bend and deform and bend these hair cells as this fluid moves. Embedded in the gel are also these uh, granules called otoliths. So again, these high density uh, particles that are going to allow us to perceive position relative to gravity. So we also use this mechanism of um, statoliths to detect gravity or linear movement as you move forward. 
those statoliths are going to move to another part of the uh, sensory area and allow you to detect that you're moving forward or in some linear way. Rotational movements, so turning of the head, um, doing somersaults, any kind of rotational movement is detected by these three semicircular canals. These are oriented in three perpendicular planes to one another so that we can detect rotations of the body in any direction. And they're also going to contain fluid with these little cupula organs that are going to detect deflections of these hair cells. In fish and aquatic amphibians, we see another sensory structure called lateral line system, which is also going to detect changes in water pressure directly. So here we see a fish. You can see this line kind of going down the side of its body, and that is the lateral line. That's where these little lateral line organs are located. And so if we look kind of between the scales and a close-up, uh, we can see these little lateral line organs. So groups of hair cells are embedded in gel-like dome structures called cupulae. So and again, we have a little cupula surrounding these hair cells. And this is going to run the entire length of the body. So the difference, changes in pressure waves within the water can be detected in different parts along the body. So changes in water pressure, these changes are going to be due either to the fish's own movements or other things moving the water in their environment. And these changes are going to cause the little hair cells, the cilia and the hair cells, to bend as, this, as the water pressure pushes on this cupula. Then the bending of the cilia are going to produce an action potential in the sensory neurons to the brain that's going to tell the fish that a water is moving past it in a particular way. So I want to point out some of the similarities in all of these mechanoreceptive systems that we've just looked at in detail. So if we look at all of these systems, so hearing here, lateral line system, and the vestibular balance system, I want to point out that these all use strikingly similar mechanisms of these hair cells projecting up into some kind of gelatinous substance or membrane type substance that's going to detect the deflections. So in the case of the vestibular system and the lateral line system, this is going to be a gelatinous mass that the water or fluid pushes directly against fluid in the sense of the vestibular system, the external water in the case of the lateral line. Uh, in this case, it's going to be the basilar membrane that vibrates, but it's still an incredibly similar structure. And this has led biologists to believe that these three sensory systems are related to each other evolutionarily. So they were all evolutionarily derived from the same ancestral sensory system. And so this interpretation of the evolutionary relatedness between these systems is supported by a number of different lines of evidence. So in the next web lecture, we're going to look at two of the other very general categories of sensors. We're going to look at photoreception and chemoreception. And we're going to see a lot of similarities in the different kinds of receptor systems that we've seen in both plants and also the general principles of neural transmission that we've seen in the last section of the course.